without an explanation. There are UFOs, I swear to God, this is no bull****. And these lights may be part of a worldwide visitation. Now, for the first time, witnesses are coming forward. Tony Park Police Station was being inundated with phone calls, so everybody was calling the cops. With never before seen footage of the Tinley Park lights. There's something there, and I can't explain what it is. I got it on tape! I got it! This is case number 97001, Invasion, Illinois. Right outside our front window, we were able to see it. Three red lights in the sky. August 21st, 2004, Tinley Park, Illinois. In this quiet suburb, just 30 miles south of Chicago, many are taking advantage of what they think will be a normal summer night. They're gathered at block parties, at barbecues, and at a local concert by rocker Ozzy Osbourne. The mood is festive and the skies are clear, but not for long. I got it on tape! I got it! The first of over 50 reports begin pouring in to local authorities just after 7 p.m. There's something strange in the skies above Tinley Park. Three bright red-orange lights that seem at times to be flying in a triangular formation and sometimes in a straight line. Actual video from that night shows the lights moving silently and slowly from west to east over the Tinley Park area, often visible for as long as 30 minutes. By 9 p.m., reports of the strange lights spread like wildfire over the Chicago suburbs. Tinley Park, Lake in the Hills, Oak Forest, Orland Park, Mokina, Madison, Frankfurt. I saw three red lights in the sky. They were kind of hovering and changing formations from a triangle to like a three in a row, one, like dot, dot, dot. And this thing just floated across the sky from southwest to northeast. Here we are at the first Midwest Bank Amphitheater, formerly known as the Tweeter Center, the site on August 21st, 2004 of OzFest. On that night, people leaving the amphitheater after the concert was over got caught in a traffic jam. And in the traffic jam, they're looking up and they see dazzling light formations in the sky. Now, we know what some people might say. I mean, it was an OzFest concert. Of course people are going to see lights in the sky. The Tinley Park case should have the makings for a really interesting case. There's a lot of evidence. We've got a lot of witness testimony spread over a wide geographic area. And the case is really fresh. It's current. And the people in Tinley Park weren't alone. This isn't just a regional mass sighting. The team believes this may be a worldwide event. A similar set of lights is captured on tape two days prior in British Columbia, Canada, then in Minnesota. The day after the Tinley Park sightings, August 22nd, the lights appear in Houston, Texas, and this actual video appears to show objects hovering over Melbourne, Australia the very next day. Triangle-shaped encounters are on the rise, joining the more traditional cigar and saucer-shaped reports. Sightings of strange triangle-shaped craft skyrocketed in the early 1980s. The military's unveiling of both the F-117 stealth fighter and the B-2 stealth bomber in November 1988 helped explain a number of these accounts. Still, many mysteries remain. The mysterious Belgium UFO of 1990, seen here, and the Phoenix Lights Triangle of 1994, 
have become landmark cases. Now it's up to the team to find out if the Tinley Park Triangle is part of this greater phenomenon. October 31st, 2004, Halloween. The triangle returns to the skies over Tinley Park. The red lights are back. They're over about the 80th Avenue train station. And again, are seen and taped by large groups of people. Hey Dad, speed up as close as you can get on this thing. The debunkers tell us these are flares. These are flares attached to balloons that are hovering in the air. Could these lights, witnessed by hundreds and maybe thousands, be simply a hoax or something else entirely? The Tinley Park investigation is underway as several angles are explored. Pat Uskert is collecting video evidence from the eyewitnesses and attempting to pinpoint the precise locations of each sighting. At this point, we really need to see a lot more information. I need to see more video. I need to talk to more people. We've got a lot of work ahead of us. Former NASA analyst Dr. Ted Ackworth will use Pat's data and the videos to scientifically calculate the size and speed of this object and with this information, attempt to identify it. Are these three points of light all fixed together as part of one rigid object? And if so, how big is this thing? And Bill Burns tests an alleged hoax to see whether the lights are actually flares attached to balloons. We may not know what these lights were, but by the end of this investigation, we're sure gonna find out what these lights were not. We're meeting Sam Moranto, uh, director of Illinois MUFON. He's our main contact here on the ground in Tinley Park. Sam was the point man. In, in, in cop shop terms, he's the squeal man for this case. He takes the first call. When everyone saw the lights, they contacted him. He's actually been in touch with all the people who have the footage, uh, the eyewitnesses, uh, the people who say they saw uh, this, this thing in the sky, whatever it was. I think I probably interviewed well in excess of 100 people. According to Sam, the Tinley Park events are among the best documented UFO sightings ever. Many people have seen UFOs. Rarely do they report them. You rarely even get so much as a, a picture out of uh, uh, most UFO cases. Approximately 25 to 30 videos exist, shot simultaneously from different parts of Tinley Park and the surrounding suburbs. There are still many more people to see and uh, talk to, more footage to recover, and I think this case is evolving. This thing was seen by thousands of people. It did make newspapers, uh, uh, you know, nationally, in Illinois, and, and even around the world. So Pat goes right to the source, a correspondent from the local paper, the Southtown Star. I'm meeting with Jason Freeman. As a journalist, he's, he's objective. He doesn't really have anything to gain from this. He's just interested in, in getting at the truth, very much like we are. You know, I was amazed, um, but you know, you can never take the reporter out of yourself. So uh, I, I immediately started to, to you know, kind of get the scene. Those people who hadn't seen it, um, you know, already had their minds made up that, that it was uh, what the media said it was, road flares or whatever, all these other explanations. Whereas I think the people that saw it, myself included, uh, a little bit more open-minded. Jason writes a column about his own personal experience. I got out of my car and tried as hard as I could to get a better view of the anomalies. What exactly was it that I and hundreds of other Tinley Park residents saw that night? I'm not sure. In speaking with a journalist, it's, it's important to keep in mind that he's been trained to just record events as they occur, as unbiased as possible. To my knowledge, no one ever uh, officially explained what they were, which leads me to, you know, scratch my head even more. The police department adamantly said that these were not uh, weather balloons but flares. Uh, in fact, every other agency said the same thing. The uh, FAA said this was something that they don't know what it was because it didn't register on their radar. 
Within 35 miles of Tinley Park are Chicago O'Hare and Midway airports. How could radar operators at two of the nation's busiest airports not pick up an object seen by so many witnesses? The FAA has no answer, which causes the team to rule out commercial or private planes. Perhaps the best evidence may lie in the video. This is a unique scenario because we have so much very good footage. Sam has at least 15 distinct pieces of videotape that capture the bizarre phenomena. This was the August 21st, 2004 sighting, mass sighting. This segment of footage is from Oak Forest. I don't know what that is. I wonder how many more there are going to be, but you know what, that was really cool when it was the three of them. I don't know. Do you really think we should call and report this? Three miles to the southwest, in Tinley Park proper, another witness, T.J. Jackon, shoots this footage of the lights. Are you recording this? Yeah, now I am. While he's shooting footage further southwest, they're shooting footage from the northeast. So they're actually shooting the same phenomena simultaneously. So this is great. This is a triangulation on one phenomena that both cameras pick up. From every angle, in every neighborhood, eyewitness video captures the lights in the same triangular formation. The various lights almost stayed rigid with respect to each other as they moved through the sky. Do flares do the same thing? I think it would be premature to, to jump into this and say we're looking at some sort of a huge extraterrestrial phenomenon or, or giant craft over Tinley Park. What we have is, is three points of light in the sky, and I'd like to keep it right there until I get more information. Skeptics claim there is an ordinary explanation for the Tinley Park sightings, but the multiple witnesses don't agree. Never before seen footage from that night may finally... I knew it wasn't a plane or aircraft of any kind that I've ever seen. There was no noise. So we were kind of amazed and just started to think what it could be. And I really have no answer for that. The team is in Tinley Park, Illinois, investigating multiple appearances of an alleged triangle-shaped UFO. Hundreds, if not thousands of people, from lawyers and doctors to concert goers, claim to have seen three strange reddish lights in the sky on two separate nights in 2004. One witness, two witnesses, that's not enough. We need to get as many witnesses as possible, look at as much evidence as possible, analyze as many videos as possible, and, and from there put a picture together. Pat heads out to meet with T.J. Jackon, an eyewitness who was able to capture the alleged UFO on video. While Bill meets with Ted to find out what else might be flying over Tinley Park. One question I always have when we have sightings of lights overhead at night is what's going on with commercial airliners and maybe even military uh, aircraft operations. If we can rule out those kinds of aircraft, that leaves uh, a lot of evidence on the table that might lead to something anomalous. Situated within 30 miles of both Chicago O'Hare and Midway airports, the skies above Tinley Park are some of the most congested airspace in the United States. The air is filled with commercial and private aircraft that could be mistaken for something extraterrestrial. According to the team, the strange object might also be a misidentified military craft, but they feel this explanation is unlikely. There is a military operation area way to the north here. Mm -hmm. it's, it's about uh, it's roughly 100 miles away. And there's another one way to the southeast, also on the order of 100 miles. So I wouldn't say, A, there's no military operation area, and B, you're not going to get the military operating right in the middle of this massive international commercial airspace without causing a lot of trouble. Still, Bill tries to get some kind of official statement from the military on the Tinley Park phenomenon. He contacts the group commander, a senior military official at nearby Scott Air Force Base. 
Yes, hi, I'm Bill Burns from UFO Hunters and UFO Magazine. Uh, I'm calling uh, in reference to the August 21st, 2004 lights over Tinley Park. Uh, I'm calling to find out what traffic the military had that night. You have no information about that. I understand, I understand. According to the official Air Force response received by UFO Hunters, quote, we do not have any documentation on this at all due to the high turnover of military personnel that have left since 2004 we don't have anyone that could possibly speak on this now we've got to get to the witness locations we have to interview the witnesses the more videos we have and the more witness statements we can get the more scientific data we can get over to ted to analyze on the workbench to see what we really have in front of us I saw three red lights that were slowly hanging in the sky. It was the most incredible thing I had ever seen. I've never seen anything like it before. I've never seen anything like those lights. 10.45 p.m., August 21st, 2004. T.J. Japcon and Dave Wagner are at a block party with approximately 70 friends and neighbors. They have no idea that their party is about to have some uninvited guests. My son had seen three lights come up right above the trees. Are you zooming all the way? Yeah, Jake, look at that. Okay, wait, leave it. Okay, you guys. UFO. Someone's saying UFO, and I did turn around finally, and I saw it, and I'm like, what in the world are these things? We, we've just never seen yeah, anything like Everybody that was just staring at it. Just, it just floated across the sky. Three red lights and like a triangle. TJ gets his video camera and manages to capture the object on tape for an incredible 18 minutes. It's going too slow for a helicopter, too. That's going right over us. As they watch, they believe the object is maneuvering in ways beyond the capacity of conventional aircraft. Minute it time. took about 15 or 20 minutes to move from here to over there. And then it stayed, it stayed stationary for a little while, and then it crawled again. So it actually stopped at one it point? It stopped, yeah. yeah. So it moved across the sky, stopped, and then it continued moving. Yeah. Yep. Wow. The slow pace and stationary hovering of the object is highly inconsistent with typical aircraft flight behavior, and these locals know it. When a police officer stops by the block party, he is bombarded with questions about the object. We had stopped him, and we asked him what was going on, and he goes, right now, he goes, I can't talk. He has to get back to the station because the station, uh, Tilly Park Police Station, was being inundated with phone calls. Yeah, so everybody was calling the cops. Everyone was calling the police. UFO hunters contacted the Tinley Park Police Station for a statement. The officer in charge had no comment on the case, but their own incident dispatch report shows they did receive calls of red lights in the sky that night. After half an hour, the object slowly disappears into the night. Whoa! Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Gone. But around 11.30 p.m., TJ and Dave have another sighting. A single red point of light that follows the same path as the object seen earlier. Oh, come on. Kurt! They're back! The UFOs are back. This time, Dave is ready. He has a high-powered telescope in hand. I didn't see any sides or anything, but from the naked eye, it looked like one dot in the sky. But through the telescope, it looked oval-shaped with about 10 or, red, 10 or 12 red lights around it. Pat collects TJ's video and other data for Ted to analyze. He uses a GPS locator to plot the precise location of the sighting. Next, a clinometer helps establish how far off the horizon the alleged UFO appeared to be. Finally, compass readings pinpoint the trajectory of the UFO across the sky. Definitely the footage that TJ just showed me is very similar to the footage I saw earlier with Sam. These are definitely videos of the same event, the same lights over uh, Tinley Port, whatever they were. What was this object? What was its size? And how far away was it from the witnesses? Or was it an object at all?
In order to complete the triangulation, Ted will need data from one final location. With this information, he can also start estimating the size and speed of what these people were seeing, and perhaps even identify it. That same night, Bob Peterson is with his children in his backyard when he sees the same triangle-shaped object. Dawson, go ask Mom for the telephone. I want to call somebody. What made you take notice of these lights? I just happened to look up, and there were three red lights in the sky. It, it was definitely an odd thing to see. We are kind of in a flight pattern here from Midway Airport. There's a lot of activity uh, as far as planes are concerned. So at first, I did think they were helicopters, but as they got closer, I mean, they were dead silent. There was just no noise coming from them. So at that point, you know, it, it wasn't a helicopter. How about airplanes? No, it's way too slow. Despite his sighting, Bob is not convinced that he has seen anything extraordinary. My opinion is there, there was some type of hoax put on. I, I don't know what it would be. Bill Dooley, Bob's friend and neighbor, also witnesses the lights. But his reaction is very different. We actually had a high-powered telescope back here at the time. And one of our friends got right on it. But he said it looked just like we're seeing it with our naked eye. I thought it was something, you know, some kind of flare or something like that. You know, we thought about that, that you would see some kind of smoke, and we didn't. Again, Pat takes the crucial location data for both Bob and Bill's sightings. With three distinct locations, his data compilation is complete and ready to send to Ted. But before Ted comes to any kind of conclusion, the team has a critical experiment to perform, one that will put them directly. If it was a hoax, they did a really good job, whoever created the hoax. That's all I could say. Skeptics and debunkers claim that the three bright red lights seen by hundreds of witnesses in the skies above Tinley Park, Illinois, are nothing more than flares attached to weather balloons. But those who actually saw the lights with their own eyes hold a different opinion. My son and I were on the phone together watching the UFO. Planes, lights normally flash, but these um, lights didn't flash. It was, it was exciting and it was disturbing. Dr. Ted Ackworth has worked for NASA's Flying Imaging Aircraft Program. He is joined by Terence Masson, an image processing expert from Northeastern University. They begin by analyzing footage shot by T.J. Jabcon on August 21, 2004. Ted feels it has the highest image quality of the nearly 30 pieces of video UFO hunters have collected. My first thought was it was going to be necessary to stabilize because these are shot by uh, normal people, background, um, handheld, so we've got you know this kind of swimming motion. Of, sure, that's pretty yeah. typical. Once we've done that, uh, I was able to then uh, pick one of the three lights and translationally pin that so that all of the related emotion is basically locked around that point. Having stabilized one point of the three, Ted and Terrence are able to see how the other two points move around it. Are they free floating or locked in place? To me, uh, and the numbers bear it out, that it does look like the, uh, the other two trailing points are locked to that third nodal point uh, in rotating. So either they're fixed to the same physical structure, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a triangular craft, or they, if, if it's um, man-made, uh, they have to be some kind of I-beam, some kind of physical connection. Mm -hmm. If the lights are all connected, why do they sometimes appear as a triangle and other times appear as a straight line? Is the object shape-shifting. Ted and Terence's analysis shows that's not the case. The most likely answer is, as the attached lights move in the sky, the only thing that shifts is the viewer's perspective. To my eye, it appeared that those three lights seemed to be locked together geometrically, and his analysis uh, agreed with that. We now quantitatively know that those three points of light are locked in, in space together. Ted and Terrence still cannot determine whether there is a solid triangular craft with a light on each point 
or three individual lights that are somehow able to rotate together. One segment of TJ's footage from October 31st, 2004 shows a conventional aircraft, a helicopter, flying near the triangle shape. The team contacted all local airports, the FAA, Pilots of America, and numerous other aviation organizations in hopes of finding the pilot. One pilot responded saying he had been in the air and saw something strange that night. When asked for an interview, he refused, claiming he feared for his job. I'm hoping that we can get a sense of the overall size. Is this thing uh, 10 feet across or uh, a quarter mile across? We could take the height of that helicopter image in this mm -hmm. frame right. uh, and, and compare that to the height of the, the right. lights and calculate the distance between right. those two lights. Because spatially, just in the, uh, the imagery uh, itself, it's probably about 30 times the, the linear width of this helicopter, right? Yeah, that's getting up to 1,000 feet. 1,000, say 1,000 feet as yeah. opposed to the width of the helicopter. So based, based on this method, I think we're in the ballpark you know, uh, of 1,000 plus feet mm -hmm. in separation between these, these, uh, right. these three lights. With their estimate of 1,000 feet between the points of light, Ted and Terrence plug in the location data that Pat has gathered from the eyewitnesses. The GPS locator pinpoints each sighting on the map. The clinometer reading reveals the angle of elevation, or how high off the horizon the lights appear to be. Compass readings indicate in which direction the alleged UFO is traveling. Without this additional information, no true estimate of the size of the object can be made. Based on the clinometer and compass readings, the witnesses all appear to have seen the same object to the west and low to the horizon, between 5 and 10 degrees. And we know from the footage here from, from TJ, which is, is taken from here, looking in that direction, yeah. at about a, a, roughly a 10 degree elevation, that our object is, is approximately that distance away from right. TJ. And we figured that was about two and a half miles. If the unknown object is two and a half miles away, at an average of seven degrees off the horizon, and with 1,000 feet between each point of light, then they can estimate its total size. I think 1,500 is a pretty good estimate, plus or minus a couple few hundred feet. It's definitely not the, uh, the, uh, the distance from wingtip to wingtip of anything that... Absolutely not. And I don't know any structure that you could fly that, would, that could hold lights 1,500 feet apart. To the best of their knowledge, the alleged UFO over Tinley Park is one object several thousand feet in the air and about 1,500 feet from end to end. To put that into a reference to something we might know, think of a 747 or, or the newer uh, A380 aircraft. Those are about 200, 250 feet in wingspan. So we would have to stack up about six of these to get the span that we're seeing from our evidence in this case. And that's just beyond. That, that's like 6x, the largest aircraft that we have. Based on all of this evidence, the video, the spatial recreation, the estimation of motion, uh, the image processing, uh, I don't know what it is. There's definitely something out there of this 1,500 feet uh, span, but uh, I have no idea what it might be. This could be an elaborate hoax. People say that there were red flares in the sky. Don't think that it was some type of a spacecraft. Um, it, there just wasn't any evidence to me that it was anything other than three, three lights that were not connected. Although there's never been an official explanation for the lights over Tinley Park, uh, there are some people who believe that these were nothing more than flares tied to balloons. And it's an interesting theory, one that we have to test. So that's what we're doing here today. We're actually going to set some balloons with flares aloft and see if they look anything like the uh, Tinley Park footage from 2004. Cleared by local authorities, the test will allow the team to compare the color and intensity of the flares as well as the way the balloons and flares move in the night sky with the original footage of the lights over Tinley Park. 
But Ted's analysis proved the lights were connected by something solid. So if this was a hoax, it was rather elaborate. We suspect that there's a frame between the lights, an object between the lights that you can't see in the darkness. So what we're doing to test this out is we're building triangles out of the PVC pipe and attaching flares to the end of those corners. So in effect, we're making our own flying triangles out of flares and balloons. Let's see what they look like compared to the footage we have. As the team unloads their equipment, the weather begins to take a turn for the worse. Much worse. We're looking at major lightning right now, big storm coming this way. We have to shut this thing down and get inside and get some shelter. Bill and Pat manage to get the materials for the experiment inside, but the danger is far from over. They don't call this tornado alley by accident. I grew up in California, we just don't have this. Uh, I've, you know, I've seen lightning before. I've heard a little bit of thunder. This is, uh, you know, what, what can I say, but welcome to Illinois. As you can hear, we've got a lot of bad weather coming in. The team is in rural Illinois, in a controlled environment supervised by local authorities. In spite of the weather, the team soldiers on, building the PVC frame. Three weather balloons, five feet in diameter, are filled with helium gas and attached to the frame. But it soon becomes apparent that the frame is too heavy for the balloons to lift. The larger we got, the heavier the frame got, and the more impossible it was for the balloons to lift this thing. So it just seems like if they're, if they're describing a giant triangle, there's just no way these balloons could lift this thing. It would take possibly hundreds or even thousands of balloons to lift a structure that large. They know from Ted's analysis the object is massive and the lights are connected. It's unclear how such a hoax could be possible. Still, the team works to get the balloons airborne and in formation in order to compare the flares to the strange lights on the videos. I think the lightning has passed. We may have a window to launch. Sam Moranto and several eyewitnesses from 2004, Bill Dooley and his son Nick, and Bob Peterson and his son Tyler arrive for the test. Since they saw the lights with the naked eye originally, they're the best witnesses to tell us, hey, this looks like the lights we saw, this didn't look like the lights we saw. For test purposes, they've also brought the same cameras they filmed the Tinley Park lights with in August of 2004. So what we want to do is maybe use their cameras to take footage of the balloons that we launch and compare them to their footage from 2004. Let's see how it matches up. The three balloons are attached on a line at 15-foot intervals. A flare is then suspended from each balloon. Gentlemen, light your flares. Make it one launch. Balloon two. Go ahead, Jake. While Sam and the team have only seen the video evidence of the Tinley Park lights, Bob, Bill, and their sons are eyewitnesses. They know firsthand what the object looked like in 2004. The quality of the colors, the way it held its triangular form, and how it moved across the night sky. Now, what we saw in the summer of 2004 was much steadier flow of light, not jerking around like they did. The color was bright red, like you'd see a light on top of a cell tower. Uh, this was more orange, more pink, so no, nothing like it. Bob Peterson's initial impression is that the 2004 lights are a hoax. But this demonstration has given him a new perspective. Based on what I saw tonight, no, I don't think it was a flare. Um, it, there's, there was just too much that was different about it. He thought they were flares, but now he's looking at flares. And he says they did not behave 
the way the lights behaved when he first saw them on August 21st and October 31st. A final meeting with Sam Maranto reveals that the night of the original sighting, August 21st, 2004, may be part of a worldwide UFO flap. And Tinley Park's history of UFO sightings didn't begin in 2004. As you may have already found out and have some indication, this area has been a hotbed for activity. Project Blue Book, the Air Force actual investigation into UFO phenomena, actually had one of their cases here in Tinley Park. What was the case? The case was um, two young men seeing an unusual object. They reported it, and it was investigated and still remains unknown. And that was in the early 60s. Was there any other activity around uh, the case that we're working with now? Well, I'll tell you one thing, Pat. We had August a hot month. Objects very similar to what was seen out here was seen on the 18th in Canada. On the 19th, we have that object over Minneapolis-St. Paul hovering there for a period of almost nine hours. Then here we go, the 21st in Tinley Park. After that, Houston, Texas. A few hours later into the 23rd, what do we have in Melbourne, Australia? Same thing again. Is it possible that these were all sightings of the same object? What was the date of the Australia sighting? The Australia sighting was on the 23rd, but remember, their dateline is ahead of us by 16 hours. What are the chances of these lights popping up here and then in Australia uh, a on couple days next, later? On the very next day. Sam Maranto has uncovered video from Australia that appears to show two of the Tinley Park type objects seen here for the first time. Oh no, my battery's running out. Oh, no, I'm not. On September 30th, 2005, the same configuration of lights returns to Tinley Park and again is widely seen and taped by the residents. The object appears to be the same one seen in 2004 and yet another sighting occurs barely a month later on October 31st, Halloween 2005. With all of the evidence gathered for this case, the team waits for Ted to weigh in on the experiment. How will the new footage stand up to the original 2004 video of the mysterious lights over Tinley Park? When I saw those three lights in the footage, nothing came to mind instantly that, hey, oh, it, that's a commercial airliner, that's a helicopter. Uh, I'm very intrigued, there's something unusual there, and I hope to get to the bottom of it. Now, with footage in hand, Ted and Terrence are preparing to scrutinize several aspects of Bill and Pat's experiment. Even with an absolutely perfectly still, calm atmosphere, you're still going to get this kind of unrelated random motion to these two points. Right. Now, of course, right. in this case, there was actual some kind of wind, and they're just all over the place. As Bill and Pat noted in the field, their balloons behaved erratically in the wind, in stark contrast to the 2004 footage. According to National Weather Service data, on the night of the experiment, winds are clocked at 12 miles per hour. In 2004, the winds are more than twice as strong at 30 miles per hour. Yet the lights do not exhibit the same erratic behavior as the flares and balloons. I mean, I can imagine a tether, like a nylon filament tether, right. but that would only limit the, the, the distance the this way, the, uh, but not this right. way. And we're seeing that they're not kind of bouncing in towards one another and hitting outer limits. They're locked. What this seems to reinforce to the team is that the 2004 lights must be locked in place via some form of rigid structure. Without this, the light should exhibit the same volatile behavior as the experiment video. The longer it holds that right. uh, configuration, the stronger and stronger the case that they are actually yeah. locked. That's a pretty important conclusion. I think so. Yeah, it's, it's definitely not three independent uh, floating flares. But does this prove that the witnesses in Tinley Park and other locations around the world photographed a flying craft? 
Ted and Terence also want to contrast the color and light quality of the flares in comparison to the original footage. Unfortunately, it's, it's very hard to tell with these consumer grade cameras. Uh, the exposure settings and the sensitivity is such that you can shoot uh, dramatically different colored lights. Mm -hmm. And uh, very often you're going to see them basically bloom to almost solid white. The biggest difference uh, that's pretty clear to me is the, uh, the intensity differences. Right. The flickering, basically, for lack of a better word, uh, is very evident in the flares. Ted and Terrence also look for scintillation, any fluctuation in the quality of the light. A constant light source will have less scintillation than a less stable source like the flares. To me, it's actually an illuminating source. Uh, it's very clear, you know, some kind of light, right. uh, as opposed to some kind of burning uh, combustion. Right. Which will have its own uh, um, variability. Right. But Terence brings up another intriguing point of comparison. The experiment clearly shows the flares dropping residue, but in the original video from 2004, there is no evidence of any residue. I'd love to be able to say that our experiment and our analysis of the evidence leaves us with a very credible explanation. This was, was flares floating on balloons. Um, but I can't say that. I, I think uh, it's, it's extremely unlikely that, that that is the explanation for what we have here. I can say definitively that there's no way that I can see any kind of tethered balloon light source, flare or otherwise, um, would be responsible for the footage that we have. Without saying it's an alien spacecraft, I can definitively say, by the strictest definition, it is an unidentified flying object. The Tinley Park case is a really interesting case to me. We've got a lot of data. We have a lot of witness testimony. We were able to do some extremely quantitative scientific analysis of our, of our evidence. To the best of my ability, I, I can't put my finger on an explanation to say, oh, it was something terrestrial. All I can say is that I, I can't explain what it is, and, and yet is a highly credible, uh, corroborated case. So there's something there, and I can't explain what it is, and, and that is very intriguing to me. I believe we have a genuine anomalous aerial event that occurred over Tinley Park in 2004. Some people say it was a hoax, but we have no evidence that it was a hoax. Now I know in other UFO cases, pilots, both military and civilian, have come across these orbs of light, and that could be what we're dealing with here. So in my opinion, this case is still open. You have to ask yourself, are these people seeing the same object in the sky? Is this a worldwide UFO phenomenon? Or is this a worldwide UFO hoax? Both scientific and subjective testimony suggests that the object was not flares attached to weather balloons. Video analysis reveals something of massive size. Does the Tinley Park mass sighting and the mountain of visual evidence around it provide a glimpse of an actual UFO? Or are the answers still floating somewhere in the skies above Tinley Park? terrifying information to come out so that there'll be people in a camp of, uh, you know, oh, there are good ones and there are bad ones and we're going to choose sides and it's Star Wars all over again. I mean, this is like, uh, uh, you know, a wet dream, I hate to say that, for the intelligence community to have people, uh, you know, brainwashed this way. And I, you know, what I think that, you know, when I met years ago, I got a document, um, it's in the film very briefly, Sirius, which you can see at our website, S-I-R-I-U-S is the name of the film, and, and it came out last year as the biggest crowdfunded film in history. And what happened is, in this document, it was, although they didn't spend much time on it in the movie, I would have liked to spend more time, is that it was from the Strategic Studies Institute, and it was talking, this is 1996, about creating a global abduction cult and to simulate human uh, being abducted by aliens that would be done with very advanced aircraft and the stagecraft of creatures that look like aliens but aren't. And, you know, this document is in black and white. And it's an authentic document describing this program. Now, you know, if, if that's all there was, I'd say, well, you know, that's interesting. But then I've met with so many 
men and women who've been in these projects. Um, I remember talking to a man who uh, had been in a program back in the 70s, uh, it was the late 60s and 70s, where they were doing this. And he says, oh, yeah, back then we didn't have as good a stagecraft, as they called it, as we do now. But we were able to get these anti-gravity devices and have people appear to be aliens. And they would use various chemical substances, electromagnetic weapons, and they would engage in various types of abductions and also mutilation events back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and for livestock. And he said we were doing that because we knew that that would make its way into the tabloid media and the UFO subculture and begin to start this, this slowly snowballing effect of fearing everything alien. So that's sort of how the game is played. It's been played for thousands of years by despotic uh, demagogues, whether they be religious figures or political figures. Uh, and there's always an agenda behind it. The agenda behind it is to manipulate people through fear. And I think that, you know, one of the big challenges of this era right now is for people to transcend and see through that. And it's like the old Who song, we won't be fooled again. And I, you know, unfortunately, I think a lot of people have been fooled. Uh, and the idea that these um, programs aren't very well funded and extremely sophisticated in the technologies they have, uh, you know, it's just a wrong idea. They are well funded albeit illegally, and they are very sophisticated in the technologies they have and also in the ability they have to stage something and fool people. So I think you have to view so much of this with, a, with an eye of, uh, it's sort of like, is it real or Memorex, you know, the old commercial years ago about the audio tapes. You know, is it actually an ET event or is it something masquerading as ET or alien for the purpose of psychological warfare, like the Benowitz case? Uh, that everyone probably knows about the Air Force Office of Special Investigations case back in um, uh, the day in, in the uh, near Sandia National Laboratories in Kirkland Air Force Base, uh, where you know they really did stage not only a human abduction but a whole series of things and documents to um, put people off the course. Now, what a lot of people don't know is what they were really trying to hide, aside from putting out the false information, is that there was a woman that uh, Paul Benowitz knew that had actually seen near Kirkland and Sandia a man-made anti-gravity propulsion device that looks like a UFO. And in order to sort of brainwash her into thinking that was not ours but alien, they set up this whole series of things that Richard Doty and others were involved in. And I think that this is a real problem because, you know, uh, it, you know, you can't take things at face value, and when you do, you're going to find that you're just being played by some very sophisticated people who have a lot of experience manipulating mass markets and mass media and subcultures into a certain type of reactive or reactionary perspective. And, and I'd say, well, you know, you can never prove a negative, so you can never prove that there are no civilizations out there that may not have our best interest in, at heart. But let's say even if that were true, what's your response going to be? Is your response going to be more war, i.e. Star Wars, interplanetary systems that are going into war? Well, if you understand technologies that are these scalar electromagnetic weapon systems, you can take out an entire planet with a system like that. So if, not a, if, if hydrogen bombs and atomic bombs would leave the world uninhabitable, these systems are even worse than that. So there is only one path forward, and it's peace. And it's not as exciting as a horror film about aliens. It's not as titillating about finding a new group of people. You know, you can't overtly be a racist, and you can't overtly uh, hate women, or you can't. Now they're wanting to find a way that people can overtly hate something. Well, what's the next something? Well, it's another system out there, another star system that we have to hate. It's a very convenient thing. It's tragic, but it plays into this sort of collective experience of humanity in our recorded history of ethnic groups, religious groups, political groups going to battle, going to war. And you look at the last hundred years, you know, we've killed something like 200 million of our own species in warfare on this planet, um, and often for things that are just ridiculous. Um, and yet that is, that's something that is un unfortunately one of the chief organizing principles of the current world order is an us versus them military, industrial, centralized governmental complex. 
And if they really want to be able to take that to the next level, they've got to find another enemy. So this is, this is I think, what's really deeply behind so much of the information that tends to scare people and, and turn people into these sort of dualistic camps of us versus them. Now, Dr. Greer, we are an extremely primitive species with this tribal warfare. Like you just said, these 200 million people that were killed. And obviously the next step in, in, in evolution is people need to realize that you know we are the same because there's others out there. And isn't there some sort of federation, galactic federation out there that's awaiting us for to ask them? Or, or is it, are they waiting for us Absolutely. to have peace? There is. I mean, there's, there, there's a, a very large network of interstellar civilizations that have been observing our development for a very, very long time. Now, my view on this, looking you know, stepping back and looking at the last, say, 100,000 years, most of which isn't recorded, it's been a process of humans going from tribes to you know, city-states you know, the, the, you know, Greece and the Trojans, and then going to nations and nation building, and now to something resembling of an interconnected global society, although highly dysfunctional. And then the next step, obviously, would be to become interglobal, interplanetary. However, that ticket to get to that next stage, the requirement is that you have become at least nominally civilized so that you're not murdering each other by the millions. We haven't made that leap yet. So unfortunately, our technology has advanced enormously, you know, from, you know, muskets and cannons and things of this sort in the 1800s and 1700s to thermonuclear weapons and things that are classified weapons that are even more fearsome, as well as technologies that are very, very advanced. So we have develop technologies ahead of our social and spiritual development. And that is exactly the window. That's exactly the period when a species such as ours is at greatest risk, not only to ourselves, but I know I sound like a, a doctor here, but not only dangerous to ourselves, but dangerous to others. Now, interestingly, if someone comes into my emergency department, I'm an emergency doctor by training, who's a danger to himself or others, they get committed to, to a mental facility. And, you know, I had a friend who was a Harvard psychologist. He was hilarious, and he had had an encounter outside Washington that was amazing. And he said to me, he says, yes, well, the Earth right now is the intergalactic insane asylum because we're all we're acting completely like a bunch of crazy people. And I said, yeah, I know. So, you know, the, one of the things is we have to become nominally sane. And it's not that we're going to all become perfect or enlightened. I'm not, and I doubt anyone listening is. However, we can at least stop murdering each other by the millions and setting up these systems that uh, are designed to manipulate people into larger and larger and more and more expensive battles. And I think that's something that can only be changed by the people because there's so much power uh, that is centered at the top of this uh, food chain uh, of exactly what Eisenhower warned us about, the military-industrial complex, which is now the military-industrial financial laboratory uh, you know, research complex. And at the deepest levels of it are folks who really do want to be able to maintain control over not just American or British population, but a global population by presenting an existential threat that is not human. And I think that drives so much of the agenda of the false information, the concocted cases, the stage prep. Now, have there been people who have been horrible victims of this? Yes. And, you know, a lot of people, when they've heard me say this, said, well, you're not very sympathetic to people who've been injured or abducted. I said, no, I'm very sympathetic. Where I differ is, is the conclusion of who's doing it and what's behind it. Uh, there was a physicist who used to work out at um, Pine Gap, uh, the facility near Alice Springs in the center of the continent of Australia, and um, brilliant man, and he was talking to me about how they had been manufacturing for years these creatures that look like aliens, but they're actually man-made kind of bio-nanotechnology creatures that have been used in abductions and have really been very persuasive um, for a lot of people thinking that, uh, that they had an encounter with an, an alien when it was actually something that people were making that was some excellent, excellent 
stagecraft. I say excellent in the sense of very well done, but diabolical and, and absolutely evil. And, and so I think that, you know, until you get a, you know, do a really good research on this and, and begin to drill down that, you know, since the 80s, there have been people who have concluded that, uh, you know, it's not just MK Ultra at the CIA that was doing experiments on people. There are all kinds of experiments that have been done with some technologies that most people wouldn't believe humans have. But it's because they're assuming that the technologies they know about, such as might be at MIT or Caltech or Oxford or Cambridge, that that's the state of the art. It is not the state of the art. The state of the art of the technologies are unpublished in deep black projects that are in these underground facilities near Edwards and the Nellis Range, what people call Area 51, but you know, nobody in the business calls it that. But And these technologies that are in the hands of the big corporate titans, such as Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman, and SAIC and E-Systems and Raytheon and on and on and on. Those technologies are highly classified and are, you know, most people, if they were to see them displayed, would say, oh, that's got to be alien. Well, it's not. It's just that they don't know how far these technologies over the last 50 years uh, of studying, not just science in general, but also recovered and downed ET craft, have advanced, and they are substantial. So this substantial growth in technology that's classified uh, and is not known by the general public would almost certainly fool anyone who would see it. I remember back in the early 90s, it was after I briefed the CIA director for Bill Clinton, I had a man pull me aside and he said, you know, we have technologies that are so good that if we want to have somebody have a conversation with their personal God, a Jesus, a Buddha, whoever, They'll have it, they will think it's real, and they will pass a lie detector test that it happened to them. He looked at me square in the eye. This guy, I mean, it was chilling. And I said, what are you talking about? At that time, I thought this has got to be nonsense. And he went through a lot of this, and I went, oh, my God. I mean, you know, and this is why, you know, research on this issue is not simple. It's like um, it's like an onion you pull back, and you, 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 know, you pull back 38 layers, and you think you've reached the core of it, and you've got 50 more to pull back. So it, it's a, not a simple issue. Let me ask you this, Dr. Greer. You're saying that the technology is so superior right now that they can mimic an alien abduction, mimic uh, UFO flights and anti-gravity and this. But when you're doing your summoning events and having your CE-5, could this be possible again, technology that might be man-made and you might be, uh, you know, being deceived again? Oh, absolutely. We have, we've had both happen on the same week-long training event. Um, by the way, I just want to mention to people, there are two spots still available for the week after the Joshua Tree event. You know, we're going to do the thing that Sunday night's open to the public. Then we're going to do a small team training for an entire week up in Joshua Tree that begins that night and goes for an entire week to the following Sunday morning. Um, and that's limited to, I think, about 25 people. But there are two p spots left, so if anyone has that week and wants to do it, they can go to seriousdisclosure.com and find out. But we have had that happen. I'll give you a great example. One time we were up in a, um, a lot of you probably know where Sedona, Arizona is, and we were up in that area, and we had an amazing sighting and contact with actual ET craft and these translucent beings that were around us, very ET. The craft were seamless, this and that. And then later, we had a disc fly over, but it had two jet fighters escorting it that was 100% man-made. It was a man-made anti-grav um, that was going from the south to the north. I suspect it was headed up towards... Um, the, the Provo area, the Dugway Proving Grounds, which is an underground area there south of Provo that's this, one of the state-of-the-art facilities now in America. Um, most people don't know about it. They always think of Area 51. I say, yeah, that was a cool place in the 60s and 70s. But um, so <laughs> this, this event, everyone there, there are like 30, 40 people there looked up and they said, what the hell is this? I said, well, that's one of ours. So, yeah, I, I think people have to have enough knowledge, and I think this is one of the things that we, I try to train people when I do these um, expeditions with them, is, is to say, look, here's the, the characteristics of an actual interstellar, trans-dimensional uh, extraterrestrial vehicle and these beings. Here's what 
we have that I know about that are classified projects, there there are distincting, distinguishing characteristics. Now, if it's too far away and there's not enough information, you have to say, well, gee, I don't know if that was one of ours or one of theirs. Um, um, and I think that, but if you don't even have that, you know, in medicine we talk about differential diagnosis so that if somebody has chest pain, you know, there are like 115 things that that can be. One of them is a heart attack. But if you don't know about a, the other 114 other things, you're going to miss a dissecting thoracic aneurysm, which is, of course, what killed Princess Diana. So you have got to have enough knowledge and information. What I find is uh, sort of a difficult in the UFO subculture is that it, people aren't drilling down at the depth that they need to because the people studying new energy and anti-gravity and secret aircraft uh, programs don't give much, some of them don't even think any of it's ET. A lot of the people involved with the ET and so-called alien issue don't know about the other. You really have to put all of it together in a comprehensive bit of information. And this is what I've been trying to bring forward. Uh, it, it's difficult because people want simplistic answers, but um, it ain't simple. If it were simple, this problem would have been solved before I was born in the 50s. So I think that's why we as a people have to begin to say, this has got to be childhood zen now. We have to have a mature understanding of this issue, uh, but not only in terms of how interstellar civilizations might appear in our time and space and how we might make contact with them, but what are the capabilities within the deep black programs at the Lockheed Skunk Works inside the, what's called the cube, the big underground cube area uh, near Edwards Air Force Base. What are the capabilities within, um, you know, uh, out at Pine Gap in Australia? What are the capabilities that are electromagnetic weapon systems or systems that could simulate an event? You have to know all of this in order to actually go out there and understand what's happening. And if you don't have that comprehensive amount of information, uh, you're really, it's like a blind, blind man holding on to an elephant, you know, and you may be holding on to the back end of it. You know, you, you mean, so I think it's, it's, it's a complicated issue. It's not insurmountable, but one can't take a facile, um, and it, it's not a trivial issue to, to get all this information around into a comprehensive paradigm. And that's what I didn't know 24 years ago when I started the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence and the Worldwide Disclosure Movement. I, I knew about some of this, but between 1990 and, and, the, and the year 1998 or so, I went through a very steep learning curve uh, from people who were on the inside of these projects. I mean, as you know, I have an uncle who was Northrop Grumman and worked on the lunar module, the thing that put the first man on the moon. So I had a lot of contact when I began to learn what our capabilities were that were classified that are 100% human. I went, oh my God, this is a really complex issue. It's not as simple as people think. So when I know we, Dr. J and we have some guests on the line that want to get some questions into you, Dr. Gray, like Johnny Webb, all the way from the UK, but I wanted to get this in. Uh, the false flag event. Is it on or off the table by the powers that may be a major invasion, CNN post it, and then there it is. Everybody knows that. Here, here's the extraterrestrial. We know we're not alone. Is this on the table, off the table? And, and how are you going to know if it's not, uh, it's not legitimate, if it's one of ours or if it's the real deal? Well, first of all, the interstellar civilizations have no need to invade here. I mean, I think... With all due respect to Zachariah Sitchin and others, no civilization needs to come here to get anything we have here. We don't need to be turned into slaves digging up gold. If you understand the technologies of interstellar travel, you can materialize any element, any material you want through resonance field frequencies. And I can get into this later if you want to talk about it. Um, so this is not something that, you know, there's no real reason to come here. Uh, and by the way, they estimate there are 11 billion Earth-like planets in our own galaxy, the Milky Way, which is one of billions of galaxies. So anything that's here on this planet is abundant throughout the universe. So there's no need, if you can travel from one star system in one point in space-time to another by going beyond the speed of light through these other dimensions, 
there's no reason that there'd be that kind of an event that would be for their own self-interest, number one. Number two, the, the, what you ask about this false flag event, what people haven't understood about what I'm talking about is that that event has been going on for 50 years. In other words, since Eisenhower lost control of these covert projects in the 50s, they have been putting out disinformation that has been tailored to create within the Hollywood, science fiction, and UFO subcultures this sort of aura of fear and of alien evasion and fearing all things alien. And I think this is uh, something that people don't understand. It's a long-term project. It's like Werner von Braun, when he was talking about this, uh, he was talking about it you know, in 1974. That was 40 years ago. So it isn't like this is something that's just like a singular event that's going to happen. It's an ongoing disinformation and counterintelligence project that all of us have been victims of. That's are they going to get it on two. a world scale, though, like CNN, all at once? Is that on the table, or they, that, that sure, that's they're not? Sure, that, that I would say that's something that's possible in the future, uh, and I think people would have to be very, very careful about how they evaluate what's going on. I mean, you know, I wish we had been so ca- careful about the claims about the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq before we went up and and, dan- and completely dissembled that country. And look what we have now, probably what's going to become the biggest uh, terrorist and radical state in the entire world, much worse than Afghanistan. So I think that what people have to begin to do is they need to question this. And if it's on CNN or any other major network, you really need to question it, I hate to say it, because, you know, those guys uh, are often just basically uh, taking dictation from the right hand of the king. And I'm quoting, you know, that what I just said, taking dictation from the right hand of the king, is what a very good friend of Mike Wallace at 60 Minutes told me up in New York back in the 90s, a guy named Schwartz. And uh, Schwartz, this guy told me, he said, look, he says, I used to think we had a free press. He says, you know, and he, he had been dealing with Mike Wallace on some of this stuff, dealing with these majestic documents and other things way back in the 80s and 90s. He says, what I found is that basically the big media cannot cover and will only portray things that they are ordered to do because they're corporatized. And those big media corporations are vertically and horizontally integrated into the system. So, you know, I think that... Uh, something certainly could be done like that. Now, the other th- issue is that you can have an authentic ET event, and it could be spun into something that is an invasion. For example, I'll give you a great example. Um, back during the darkest days of the Cold War, as you know from the Disclosure Project witnesses, it's done many of our intercontinental ballistic missile, our nuclear missile silos, and facilities were overflown by ET craft. A number of cases where, like in Minot, North Dakota, uh, where you had 16 to 20 intercontinental ballistic missiles, uh, thermonuclear weapons, that were rendered unlaunchable all at the same time. Now, at the same time that, the same era when that was happening, Sam, I remember talking to Sam Donaldson of ABC News about this, that, that was going on in the Soviet Union with their nuclear weapons, but in a different way. And basically, what one of the, a captain who was there in the Air Force at Minot, North Dakota, said, he really felt that the ETs were saying, don't blow up this beautiful planet. But if you do launch, know this, we can intervene so you don't destroy all life on Earth because this Earth is precious. He really got that vibe. And I said, well, of course, that's what they were saying. If they wanted to come in and just invade and sanitize the whole Earth of all this stuff, they could do that probably in a couple of nanoseconds. The problem is that would look like an invasion. So it's sort of a catch-22. They're waiting for us to fix this problem because if it's done from outside, number one, we're not going to learn any lessons and evolve. And number two, it will be portrayed by these special interests as an invasion when it isn't, when they're simply trying to help or prevent something disastrous. So I think we have to look at this in a much wiser way than the sort of the, I don't know, the paranoiac and sensationalism uh, that that permeates this issue right now. And and that's one of the more difficult things for people to accept because to be thoughtful about this is is really difficult and to be reactionary is predictable, but cliché. 
Dr. Greer, we got a break in a couple minutes, but uh, real quick, I wanted to give Blake any last words before he goes. Well, certainly, we're going to be uh, getting on location and working on our latest uh, production. It's a feature-length film. Everybody uh, take, uh, keep an eye out for it, Hangar 52. And, yeah, Dr. Greer, I, I think you're...